ever feel like you're on autopilot. Yeah. Like you want a life that feels truly designed, but somewhere along the way, life kind of threw a wrench in things. Yeah, it's like you had this like picture perfect plan and then reality set in. It happens to the best of us. It's like you're stuck on this default path, just going through the motions. And that's where I think this book we're diving into today really hits home. Absolutely. Designing your life. It's like a breath of fresh air, you know? Right. By Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. It's all about taking this concept of design thinking, something you usually hear about in like the tech world or architecture and applying it to your own life. Yeah, and what's so cool about it is that it really flips the script on how we usually approach life's big questions. Totally. Like, we often get so caught up in finding that one right answer, that one perfect path. Right, like there's only one way to do it, and if we miss it, we're doomed. But this book is like, hold up a sec. What if there isn't just one solution? Yeah. What if we're thinking about it all wrong? It's so liberating, right? Because it opens up all these possibilities instead of boxing you in with limitations. I love how they tackle this right from the get-go with that classic question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Talk about pressure. Oh, I know. I still get asked that sometimes. And it's like, um, I'm still figuring it out. Thanks for reminding me. Right. And the book points out how that question kind of implies that there's this finish line, a singular destination, as if we ever stop growing and evolving. And that's just not how life works, is it? Totally not. So instead of asking, what do you want to be? Burnett and Evans are like, how about we ask who or what do you want to grow into? It's such a subtle shift, but it makes all the difference. Yeah. It's huge mm -hmm. because it takes the pressure off this idea of like, okay, I need to have it all figured out by this date. It acknowledges that change is inevitable and actually encourages you to like embrace that evolution. Totally. And it plays into this whole idea they talk about, which is that fighting reality is a losing battle. You know, like if you're miserable at your job, but you're pretending everything's fine or you're trying to force yourself into a mold that just doesn't fit. Yeah, you're setting yourself up for frustration. Exactly. <sighs> and that's where they introduce this concept of anchor problems versus gravity problems. OK, I'm all ears. Break those down for us. So an anchor problem is basically something that in theory is solvable, but you're stuck. You're clinging to a solution that's not working, even though there are other possibilities out there. Like they give this example of Dave, one of the authors with his garage. Okay, I'm listening. So he had this vision of transforming it into this dream workspace, but year after year, it just wasn't happening. He was so anchored to this idea, but it wasn't working. Oh my gosh, I feel that. I have that problem, but with my entire apartment, I'm adding tackle the apartment yeah. to my to-do list right now. <laughs> okay, so that's an anchor problem. What about gravity problems? Yeah. Gravity problems are those realities we all face that, well, we can't really change, like actual gravity. You can't just wish it away. True. Or, and this might be a tough one for some, the reality that, statistically speaking, becoming a full-time poet might not come with a six-figure salary. My dreams of being a starving artist just took a nosedive. But I get your point. There are certain realities you just can't ignore. Exactly. And the book emphasizes that it's okay to acknowledge those realities. Don't expend energy fighting them. Just accept them for what they are and redirect your focus. So we've accepted that we need to maybe reframe our thinking a bit, acknowledge those gravity problems, and focus on what we can control. Mm -hmm. But where do we even begin? Yeah. How do we figure out what we actually want to grow into? Well, that's where understanding your energy comes in. And to illustrate this, we need to talk about Dave Evans's almost career as a marine biologist. So picture this. Young Dave, our co-author, completely obsessed with becoming like the next Jacques Cousteau. Scuba gear, underwater adventures, sign me up. Exactly. Inspired by those documentaries and, you know, a well-meaning teacher, he goes all in on marine biology, convinced it's his destiny. Okay, sounds amazing. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that Dave quickly realizes he can't stand the reality of, like, actual biology, especially those intense biochemistry courses. Oh, no. So he's putting in all this work, but it's just not the right fit. Exactly. He was working on the wrong problem. He thought the problem was getting better at biology when what he really needed to figure out was what kind of work actually lit him up. It's like that saying, if you're climbing the wrong ladder, you'll never reach the right roof. Mm -hmm. So how do we avoid falling into that trap? How do we figure out what the right problem even is to begin with? Well, this is where the book introduces a really helpful tool, the Life Design Dashboard. Ooh, I love a good visual. Tell us more about this dashboard. What's it all about? It helps you assess your satisfaction in four key areas of life, health, work, play, and love. Okay, the four pillars of a well-designed life. Right. 
But here's the thing, it's not about achieving this perfect balance in all four areas at all times. Because let's face it, that's just not realistic. Yeah, life is messy. So what's the dashboard actually for then, if it's not about perfect balance? Think of it like the gauges on your car's dashboard. You don't need every gauge to be perfectly in the middle at all times. Right. It's more about making sure nothing's drastically off. Exactly. The dashboard helps you notice which areas might be running a little low and which ones are fully fueled. So I'm picturing this dashboard in my mind. Got my health gauge, my work gauge, my play gauge, and my love gauge. Mm. And I'm checking in with how each one is feeling. Yes, it's about awareness. For example, they talk about Fred, this entrepreneur who realized his health and play gauges were practically running on fumes. Yikes, sounds like burnout waiting to happen. Right, and then you have someone like Debbie who on paper had it all figured out, the work-life balance, the successful career, but her love gauge was pretty low. The dashboard helped her see that something needed to shift. I love that. It helps you really pinpoint those areas where you might need to give yourself a little more attention or make some changes. But how does this connect back to finding the right problem to work on? You know, like in Dave's case with the marine biology thing. Because a huge part of designing a life you love is understanding your energy. What energizes you versus what completely drains you. Totally. And that's where they introduced the idea of keeping a good time journal. Exactly. Throughout your day, you just jot down your activities and note your energy levels. Were you like super engaged in that brainstorming meeting or maybe you felt most alive when you're working on that creative project? It's about noticing those patterns. Exactly. Because once you start paying attention, it's amazing what you discover. Just like Michael, the civil engineer. What about Michael? <laughs> so through his journaling, he realized that while he loved the challenge of tackling complex engineering problems, he absolutely dreaded the administrative parts of his job. Oh man, I know that feeling. The paperwork can be such a drag. Right, and they also talk about Bill, one of the authors, and how he realized his drawing class always left him feeling energized and excited while those faculty meeting. Well, let's just say they were a mixed bag. Yeah, I think we've all been in those meetings. The point is, these stories highlight the importance of understanding what brings you into a state of flow, that feeling of being so engrossed in something that you lose all track of time. I love that. It's like that feeling of being totally in the zone, doing what you love, and time just flies by. Exactly. And finding that sweet spot where challenge meets skill, it's like that perfect recipe for engagement. But what if even after doing the dashboard, after all the journaling and identifying our energy zappers and energizers, we're still feeling stuck. Like, what if we discover we're totally energized by, say, pottery, but we have no idea how to turn that into a career change? That's a great question. It's one thing to identify what you love, but then there's that whole figuring out how to make it a sustainable part of your life. Well, that's where the power of mind mapping comes in. It's a brainstorming technique they use to generate ideas and break free from those mental ruts. Sometimes you just need to get all those thoughts swirling around out of your head and onto paper. Exactly. Yeah. And it can lead to some surprising discoveries. They have this great story about a guy named Grant who was totally miserable in his corporate car rental job. I can't imagine that's the most fulfilling line of work. So how do you use mind mapping to get unstuck? Well, the only time Grant felt truly alive was when he was hiking in the redwoods. Ah, uh, nature. So he used being outdoors as the starting point for his mind map. And from there, he started branching out to related ideas. Exploration, nature, adventure. I can already see the branches of this mind map expanding in all sorts of interesting directions. Exactly. And that's the cool part. Through this process, Grant realized that he didn't necessarily need to quit his job and become a park ranger to feel fulfilled. He could actually leverage his current job. Okay, how'd he do that? Well, his company had offices worldwide. He realized he could potentially transfer to a location that would allow him to explore new places and be closer to nature. Wow. So the mind map helped him reframe the problem. Mm -hmm. Instead of, I need to find a new job, it became, how can I make my current situation work for me? Exactly. And that's the beauty of mind mapping. It helps you uncover those unexpected connections and possibilities you might not have considered before. It's about getting creative and seeing what emerges. So we've got our internal compass from the dashboard pointing us toward those energy zones. We've got our mind map bursting with ideas. But how do we start moving from ideas to action? How do we test out those possibilities and see if they're actually a good fit? That is where prototyping comes in. It's all about trying things out, experimenting, and asking good questions along the way. And it doesn't have to be this big, scary thing. Okay, I think we need some concrete examples. What does prototyping actually look like in the context of 
well, life. Well, let's go back to Dave and his dream garage. Remember, he was completely stuck. Oh, right. His anchor problem. So how did prototyping help him finally tackle that? Instead of getting overwhelmed by this huge project, he realized he could break it down into smaller, more manageable steps. Makes sense. So he started by just experimenting with different layouts, trying out different organizational systems. He prototyped different solutions until he found what worked. He went from feeling paralyzed to actually taking action. Exactly, and that's key. Choose action over analysis paralysis. Another inspiring example is Melanie, who had this dream of creating a dorm dedicated to social innovation. Wait, did she just like start knocking down walls and building a community center? Not quite. She started by prototyping the idea. She researched existing theme dorms, formed a student club focused on social innovation, and eventually ran a pilot program in an actual dorm. She was strategic about it. So she was basically testing out her idea in stages, gathering evidence along the way. Exactly. And then there's John, who was like completely burned out from his corporate job and felt really drawn to opening a community center. Okay, that feels like a big leap. How do you even begin to prototype that? He started small. He started volunteering at different organizations to just understand the landscape better. He hosted some events to gauge community interest, and he talked to people who had successfully made similar career transitions. He was gathering intel, testing the waters, refining his vision. Exactly, and that's the thing about prototyping. It can take many forms. It's not just about building a physical product. It's about testing out those ideas in the real world, getting feedback, and adjusting your course as you go. It's about embracing that experimental mindset. Absolutely. And the beauty of prototyping is that it takes the pressure off finding that perfect solution right away. It's about getting curious, asking good questions, and embracing the process. So we're gathering data, learning from our experiments, and course correcting as needed. Exactly. And that experimental mindset is crucial, especially when you're thinking about making big life decisions, like finding a fulfilling and meaningful career. And speaking of finding fulfilling work, can we talk about the dreaded job hunt? It can feel like you're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping something sticks. It's definitely a process. And you, you know, what's funny is that designing your life kind of throws out some of that, like, traditional job searching advice, like they're not big fans of relying solely on the internet to find your dream job. Wait, really? I mean, isn't everything online these days? Job boards, LinkedIn, company websites. That's where you go to find out what's out there. Sure, those resources definitely have their place, but the authors argue that a lot of the most, you know, fulfilling and interesting jobs, they never actually make it to those big job boards. So are we talking like, secret societies and hidden job boards that you need a password to access? Not exactly. It's more about emphasizing the power of like networking and informational interviews. Okay, so it's about tapping into your network and having conversations. Exactly. And they have this whole concept they call life design interviewing. Life design interviewing. Yep. Okay, I'm intrigued. What is that? So a life design interview, it's not about trying to get a job. It's more about gathering stories and insight. So you're not going in with a resume and your elevator pitch ready. Exactly. You're reaching out to people who are doing work that genuinely interests you, not necessarily to ask for a job, but just to learn from their experience. So you're coming from a place of genuine curiosity. Yes. And they tell this great story about a guy named Kurt who did like 56 life design interviews. 56, that's a lot of conversations. Right. And you know what? He ended up with seven job offers. Wow. That's an incredible success rate. And yeah. to think he wasn't even technically like looking for a job in those conversations. Exactly. It just goes to show the power of being genuinely curious and making those connections. People can really sense when you're truly interested in what they do. Okay, so let's say we've been prototyping different experiences. We've had these awesome life design conversations, and now we've got all these potential paths in front of us. But how do you actually choose? It's that paradox of choice thing, you know? Sometimes having too many options can feel paralyzing. Oh, totally. Like when you go to the grocery store and there are like a hundred different kinds of cereal, suddenly you can't decide. Exactly. The book talks about this study and it's kind of funny, it involved jam. Jam, okay, now I need to hear this. What does jam have to do with making life choices? So they had these two displays of jam. One had like six different kinds of jam and the other had 24. Okay, I'm seeing where this is going. More options must be better, right? Well, people were initially more drawn to the display with 24 options, but they were way less likely to actually buy a jar of jam. It's like our brains can only handle so much before they just shut down. Right. 
So when it comes to big decisions, they suggest this three-step process. First, gather as many options as you can. Don't limit yourself too early on. Okay, so brainstorm, explore, cast a wide net. Got it. What's next? Then, and this is key, find ways